Hello. I would like to thank the Chongyang Institute, particularly Dean Wang Wen and Deputy Dean Yang Qingqing for the invitation to speak at the launch of their very important report, Decisive Battle, the Progress of China's Comprehensively Deepening Reform and High Standard Opening Up in the New Era and Prospects for 2029 and 2035. China's economic success, not just since 1978, but since 1949, has excited both admiration and envy. However, most, whether admiring or envious, do not appreciate just how great is the magnitude of China's achievement. Usual comparisons of China with Western countries or the United States forget a key fact that China's economic and social advances have been achieved from a starting point that was farther back from the West, given the setbacks imposed by imperialism, that they were achieved without the benefit of imperialism that Western countries enjoyed when they industrialized, and that these achievements were made in the teeth of continuing imperialist resistance to the development efforts that found, formed the foundation of any serious anti-imperialist project. Such imperialist resistance to China's development continue today and are even admitted by high-level US state officials who openly state that they aim to hobble China. Such development in the face of imperialism is not easy, and the history of efforts is littered with many failures. However, what the history of development of all countries, whether developed or still developing, tells us is that contrary to the usual advice given by the West to the rest of the world, that the best way to develop is by leaving the market to manage the economy, such laissez-faire market and free trade approaches to development are, in fact, surefire recipes for subordination to imperialism, economic retardation, technological backwardness, and poverty, and not for genuine and strong development. In reality, without some clearly defined state effort to foster growth, uh, technological development, and full employment of all resources in the most efficient way possible, no development has ever taken place. And this is a long process, and there are bound to be many failures, uh, hopefully temporary and local. But the reaction to these local and temporary failures cannot be the abandonment of the state-directed path of development. It has to be a determination to learn from the difficulties and failures and to try again. Too many countries have given up this effort in the favor of in favor of neoliberal free market free trade policies. Seen in this light, the resolution of the recent third plenum is exemplary. The outcome of the third plenum has been, as expected, widely criticized in the West for the simple reason that it dares to propose what the West wishes China will never do and what the West simply cannot, still cannot believe China is capable of doing, that is to say, mastering the productive forces in a way that puts it ahead of the decaying financialized capitalist economies of the homelands of capitalism and imperialism. The Financial Times is typical. It foregrounded a disappointment that the plenum did not address the country's pressing challenges, uh, which, is, which it listed as slow growth, unemployment, poverty, uh, local uh, government debt, an aging society, and the risk of deflation. It perfunctorily lamented that the lack of assertiveness in resolving these deep-seated woes is a missed opportunity. But then the business paper came to the real point. It said, for China's trade partners in the West, there is another disappointing omission. As long ago as 2004, Beijing pledged to reorient its growth model away from an over-reliance on investment and exports and towards household consumption. This, the Western governments have long hoped, would help reduce China's huge trade surpluses and reinvigorate demand. There we have it. The West wants China to consume more of its own goods rather than export them, and it wants to export more of its goods to China. And needless to say, the West does not want China to continue investing in its technological prowess and pose a technological uh, competitive threat to its the West's uh, uh, traditional dominance of high technology lines of production. Well, nice try, but no cookie. 
the third that is the message that comes from the third plenum and indeed from the Chongyang Institute's new report, Decisive Battle. While, uh, while the resolution does indeed promise to expand consumption and expand it massively, after all, what is the point of engaging in development if it does not lead to massive increases and visible increases in the standards of living of ordinary people? So it does promise to expand consumption. However, it has neither the need nor the incentive to surrender the expanded market that China will then have to Western goods, which are unlikely to be of higher quality and lower cost than what China can produce. Moreover, at the same time, it proposes to take forward both the reform and opening up, promising a new journey of comprehensively deepening reform in the new era with systematic and holistic plans, thus paving the way for a brand new stage in China's reform and opening up endeavors. And it also promises to take forward the development of new productive forces. In particular, it promises to work to facilitate revolutionary breakthroughs in technology, innovative allocation of productive factors, in-depth industrial transformation and upgrading, and the optimal combination of laborers, means of labor, and subjects of labor, as well as the renewal and upgrading. All this will give rise to new industries, new business models, and new growth drivers, and promote the development of productive forces that are characterized by high technology, high performance, and high quality. These are the words of the resolution. And if the past is any guide, barring small delays here or there, the, uh, the Communist Party of China leadership will deliver on it all. It knows that so many leaderships who abandoned the essential state role in favor of neoliberalism did not, uh, did not succeed. Um, that the way, it knows that the way to react to any local and temporary failures is not to give up, but to learn from the mistakes and failures and strengthen the essential guiding and foundational role of the state. In this attitude, which is fully reflected in the third plenum resolution, the CPC party state is supported by important organizations and intellectuals like the Chongyang Institute who recognize these facts. As the report says, quote, the comprehensive deepening of the reform and opening up in the new era will not be easy. Instead, we will have we will need to have precise foresight and strategic decision-making by constantly grasping the laws of economic and social development to conduct continuous planning and implementation according to our abilities and goal orientations, to deal with dispute coordination and inter interest integration by continuing to properly handle the relationship between primary and secondary contradictions of our country and society, to accomplish containment breakout and development breakthrough by facing up to the blackmail, containment, blockades, and pressures from anti-China forces. End of quote. This is the key reason why we may expect, that is to say, the clarity of the understanding of the CPC and the myriad of important organizations like the Chang Chongyang Institute who support the party state's development efforts. Those are the key reasons why we may expect China to go from strength to strength as the third plenum projects. Thanks very much. For, uh, for, for, and let me end by congratulating the Chongyang Institute for its exemplary work for China's development and for its newest report, Decisive Battle. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.